Imagine a man trapped in a room that's two paces across and four paces long. His bed is a concrete slab with a small rubber mattress and a thin blanket. His desk has only a concrete stool, and no matter where in this tiny room he lingers, his toilet is never further than a few feet away. He hasn't seen the sun in weeks, and when he's allowed outside, he is quickly shuttled to a caged-in area that is just four paces across and eight paces long. Inside is a deflated soccer ball and nothing more. This man is only allowed to write to or receive mail from a very restricted list of individuals, and any outgoing letters undergo intense scrutiny and censorship, taking up to three months to be delivered. A reply letter undergoes the same process, and if not rejected outright, will take another three months before the man can read it. You're just imagining this cruelty. But for many, it's a daily reality that they have lived in for years. Welcome to H-Unit at Colorado's Federal Supermax Prison, otherwise known as Hell on Earth. Isolation, solitary, or special housing units have been a punitive measure employed by prisons for centuries. While in the past a prisoner may have been thrown into solitary on a whim, today in our modern prison system it's supposed to be used only as a punishment for prison offenders or for the safety of individuals who may be at risk within the general population. Though solitary is meant to punish bad behavior and ostensibly to correct it, psychological studies dating back over the last 150 years have consistently shown that solitary confinement is extremely psychologically harmful. Individuals kept in solitary for long amounts of time can develop a form of PTSD and can become extremely averse to loud noises or bright lights. They exhibit extreme antisocial behaviors, which can be counterintuitive when the goal of the incarceration is to correct bad behavior. Instead of teaching an inmate a lesson, solitary confinement can in fact make an inmate even more dangerous and aggressive. In one famous case, an inmate released straight from isolation into parole at the end of his sentence murdered Colorado Department of Corrections Executive Director Tom Clements. The inmate had spent years in solitary confinement getting only an hour of exercise a day if the staff allowed it, which they often did not, in an outdoors cage where he remained, you guessed it, alone. Then one day he was a free man and promptly took revenge for his treatment. Solitary had turned a dangerous man even more dangerous and had clearly failed its intended purpose. Crime must be punished. That's a basic tenet of any nation which operates under the rule of law. But where is the line drawn between punishment and torture? Many Americans today on both the left and right of the political spectrum agree that solitary confinement for extreme lengths of time is inhumane, and the data clearly shows that it's counterproductive to rehabilitation, yet it remains a popular punishment at many modern prisons. Think back to the man at the start of the show. He lives in a cell that is two paces across and four paces long, sleeps on a concrete slab, has only a concrete stool to sit on, and lives and eats with his open-faced toilet always within arm's reach. He hasn't been allowed to send or receive mail in months, and on average might look forward to two letters a year maximum. The longest conversations he holds are with the guards that bring him his food, and these are over in seconds. He's lived in the same tiny cell for years, and with a life sentence he will most likely remain there until the day he dies. For most people that scenario sounds nightmarish, and some part of their humanity still cries out for at least some basic compassion for someone sentenced to life in prison. Keep them locked up by all means, but is it really necessary to keep them imprisoned in such a tiny cell for the rest of their lives? Now we want you to think about that man again, and ask yourself, what if that man was a terrorist? Would your feelings on his basic rights and treatment change at all? The hypothetical scenario we've been having you think about is not hypothetical at all, but rather a reality for dozens of inmates held at H unit in Colorado's Federal Supermax Prison. These inmates range from drug lords to major gang leaders and terrorists, and include domestic Christian as well as Muslim radicals. Al-Qaeda operatives live next door to white supremacists who have planned massive acts of violence against minority communities and been caught the same as their Islamic terrorist counterparts. Known as the Alcatraz of the Rockies, this is where the federal government sends the most dangerous men in America. For these men, they live life inside a prison that is itself within a prison. Forbidden from contact with the general population, they instead spend 23 hours a day locked up in their tiny cells. Described by a former warden as a clean version of hell, civil rights attorneys have argued that it was more accurately a dirty version of hell. That's because for years the federal government also kept its most psychotic prisoners locked up here, where they mutilated themselves, talked to ghosts, and lived in feces-smeared isolation cells for months at a time. Even for the non-psychotic prisoners though, 
H unit is hell on earth. These individuals are subject to what are known as Special Administrative Measures, or SAMs, measures which govern the rights of prisoners who are deemed to pose a serious ongoing threat to public safety and national security. On top of their extreme isolation, SAM prisoners are not allowed any contact with the outside world whatsoever, aside from a very carefully selected and screened number of contacts that typically only include close family members and their attorneys. This is because of the fear that a prisoner may communicate via code to criminal or terrorist organizations around the world. In fact, one such case happened in 2005, when three prisoners wrote letters to suspected terrorists in Europe exhorting jihad. The prisoners denied that their letters were anything more than generic personal communications, but the FBI considered the incident a serious security lapse. Now, the people a prisoner under SAM restrictions are allowed to contact is severely limited, and the individual on the receiving end of a letter has to be vetted by federal law enforcement officials before being approved for contact. That makes for a rather short list of people that a SAM prisoner may be able to communicate with, and even then their letters are thoroughly screened and censored a process which can take months. Replies are also screened just as thoroughly, adding months on the way back. As one prisoner noted, he simply gave up writing letters to his mother, as it would take three months for her to receive it and three months for him to receive a reply. These prisoners are afforded very limited phone calls, and the ones they are allowed to place are extremely restricted and very closely monitored by FBI and Bureau of Prisons who listen to every word. Even then, phone privileges are very few and far between, which makes keeping up with the lives of loved ones practically impossible. Until only recently, SAM prisoners were not allowed to watch news broadcasts at all, for fear that modern-day events might inflame some radical thoughts and behavior. Of what limited television time a prisoner may have, which is afforded only to SAM inmates who have earned Tier 3 privileges after years of good behavior, channels are often simply blacked out. Things such as newspapers and magazines are on a 30-day delay, and political articles are ripped out of the magazines before being given to prisoners. Day-to-day -day life involves their tiny 75-square-foot cell where they stay for 23 hours a day. While they're supposed to be allowed one hour of outside recreation per day, often this doesn't happen if the short-handed staff is too busy or if they simply don't feel like allowing the prisoner out. When they do get to experience their one hour of rec, they must do so in a metal cage that is approximately four paces wide and eight paces long, or about twice the size of their cell. Often prisoners can enjoy a basketball hoop and a deflated soccer or basketball. Still, for men who have spent a decade or more being locked up alone in a tiny cell, just being outdoors again is a reward enough. H-unit prisoners do not have their own shower, as most solitary units do, and instead they are escorted to a shower several days each week. However, this too can be disrupted by lockdowns or staffing issues. One prisoner, Umar Farooq Abdulmutalab, otherwise known as the failed underwear bomber, explained what his life inside H-unit was like recently. He claimed that prison staff harassed him for his religion and did their best to disrupt his practice of it. He says that he was given no access to a halal diet, and corrections officers would often mock him and desecrate both his Quran and prayer rug. He also says that he was subjected to humiliating strip searches in front of female staff, something deeply offensive for devout Muslims. If the list of abuses sounds familiar, it's because many of these same abuses were being regularly carried out on prisoners in the infamous Abu Ghraib prison by US service members. Abdul Mutalab was also forbidden from praying with others in his religion's mandatory group prayers, and he had little if any access to the contracted imam. While he used to be housed in a regular supermaximum security prison, once he was moved to H-Unit, contact with many of his friends and relatives with which he'd been allowed to correspond for years was cut off, including with his own sister. Books he ordered from Amazon to help him pass the time were also rejected without reason. Curiously, one such rejected book was The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Art of Decluttering and Organizing. Abdul Mutalab's treatment is hardly unique, and a recent complaint filed in federal court states that Mr. Abdul Mutalab experiences life in H unit at ADX as a struggle to avoid becoming mentally ill. The stories of other prisoners brought to life by the federal complaint paint a picture of life at H unit as a slow journey into oblivion, a relentless whittling away of family ties, memories, hopes, and even a sense of self. Nidal Ayad, another inmate, says that if he had heard some of the stories of what happens inside H-Unit five years ago, he would have thought that they were crazy. But now he tells of prisoners so deeply disturbed by their years of isolation that they warn him to turn off his cell's light because it emits harmful radiation. 
These prisoners live inside dark cells day and night, and some even claim that hot water is poisonous and harmful. Clearly, the mental stress of living in isolation has created a host of psychological problems for these individuals. It can be easy to disregard these complaints and simply write off H-Unit's inmates as nothing more than the scum of humanity who deserve exactly what they're getting. And with some of the world's most dangerous drug lords, gang leaders, and terrorists locked up inside, it's tempting to agree with the sentiment. Yet the conditions inside H-Unit speak loudly about our own values. But we shouldn't let the hatred and violence of others compromise our own values and the nation we strive to be. Justice must be served and evil must be punished. But how we do these things speaks more about who we really are as a society than our laws do. Do you think this is inhumane treatment? Let us know in the comments. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.